Genesis chapter 12, beginning verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country and from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you, and I'll make you a great nation, and I will bless you. And I'll make your name great, and so you shall be a blessing. And I'll bless those who bless you, and the one who curses you I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. Let's pray. Father, this covenant, this calling of Abraham really is so profound that we need to take time to consider the promises you've made and the promises you've kept, not just to Abraham, but Lord, as Abraham is a prototype, uh, he is our father in the faith and all who believe, you say in your word. Lord, would you teach us about your promises and about walking by faith? Teach us what it means and help us to grow in it tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. So let me just ask you at the beginning of our study tonight, when you hear that phrase, to walk by faith, what does that mean, to walk by faith? Help us with that. I mean, you know, I'm accused, and I think rightly so sometimes, of using Christianese. I'm so used to it. I speak to Christians from the Bible, and sometimes, you know, my son will say, Dad, people don't understand who come in who don't know the Lord. And I'm thinking, yeah, you're probably right, they don't. And I don't want to make that mistake. I want to learn to be a little clearer. But let's make sure we all understand just what does that mean to you when I use that phrase, to walk by faith? What does that mean, to walk by faith, Joanne? No matter what it looks like, trust God's promises and stand on your faith. You can do something with whatever circumstances you're facing. You can trust God's promises. Okay, to, to stand on his promises. Yes. Don't have to know all the answers. You don't have to know what's going to happen. You just have to know him. Yes. So he's trustworthy. So to walk by faith, actually, you know, when you think about it, we, I do this too. I tend to use words that are part of the phrase in my description of it. You know, I always hate definitions that use the word they're defining. I think that's a violation. Um, but we do that. Well, you know, it means this or that. And to walk by faith, you know, I remember using the expression uh, with somebody who didn't know the Lord. Yeah, since I've been walking with the Lord. And they go, what do you mean by that? I said, what? Walking with the Lord. It's like, like they picture me out walking hand in hand with Jesus somewhere or something. They didn't made no sense to them at all. We do. I do use phrases that I need to define. So to walk, first of all, what does it mean to walk? To live? Okay, so to walk means to live. Let's make sure, if you didn't know it before, now you do. It means, really, everything to do. Your, your activity as a human being in the Bible is called our walk, our, our manner of life. And to walk by faith involves everything we've said and more. Richard, you were going to add to it? So trusting more than yourself? Yes? Say again. Live your life in obedience, okay. Yes, Kim? To believe God and trust Him? To know that His plans are for you, Jeremiah 29, 11, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. 
forward movement. Okay. Okay, not leaning on your own understanding and your natural senses. So I think we've, we've, got, we've kind of got it. Um, let me ask you this. Since you guys are the Bible students, you're the ones here on Wednesday nights. You are, you are the ones who are committed students to be here. What's the context? We walk by faith, not by sight. Somebody's looking it up right now. You're disqualified. Yes? Hey? Holy Spirit. Okay, the leading of the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Okay, moving forward. Context, context, context of we walk by faith, not by sight. First of all, what book is that from? Don't say the Bible or you're in trouble with me. <laughs> okay. So, 2 Corinthians. And... And five, seven. And the context of 2 Corinthians 5 is, okay. <laughs> we have these bodies, Paul says. They're like tents. They're temporary dwelling places. And in them we groan because we want to be immortal. We want to be God, with God. We know that while we're in these bodies, we're absent from the Lord. And to be Absent from the Lord is present in body, but to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. He says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. The context has to do with death. Did you know that? We apply it to everything, but in context, Paul is talking about the fact that we live this life knowing that there's more than this life. Listen, I just came this afternoon from a local hospital, Placential in the Hospital, where I, I spent a little time with an 84-year-old dear friend of mine, Who's, uh, who loves Jesus, and she's been in our church for, I don't know, 30 years. I did her husband's funeral 20 years ago, um, who I, I've known them since I was a teenager. And uh, Jean Hendricks, uh, I think, I don't know, maybe tonight, maybe tomorrow, is, is going to be in heaven, unless the Lord chooses to do otherwise. I, I've always felt like when I go to visit a believer at a hospital, I always think this as I drive in, um, you know, hospitals for Christians should have uh, another sign. Kind of like when you go to LAX, you know, it says arrivals and departures. I, th I think hospitals should have that, arrivals and departures. There are, there are people that are coming into this world, and for, there are people that are leaving. And uh, that's where, you know, she's going to go to heaven. Maybe that's going to be her launch pad, is that ICU that I just saw her in. And yet, when we gathered around her and some of the believers who are here tonight, my family were there, just a joy as we consider the fact that we're not, you know, we, we're going to miss her, but we're going to see her again. Christians never say goodbye for the last time. She knows that when this body is done, and it looks like maybe it is, she's going to be with Jesus. She knows that. She's been living. We've had lots of conversations for decades about that, and she can't wait. And uh, although I don't want her to go, I do want her to go. And uh, th that's the context, by the way, of we walk by faith, not by sight. It's not just about everything else. It's about life and death. It's about the most important issues of life. But it involves everything you guys said as well, that we don't just look at what we see as believers. We live differently in light of the promises of God and the invisible things, which according to 2 Corinthians are the eternal things, right? Okay. Now we're going to read tonight and study tonight a very important change in the book of Genesis, uh, meaning this, we've been studying for the first 11 chapters, about 2,000 years of history, but it really is the preface of the story. We have now gotten, very quickly by the way, uh, from Noah down to the birth of Abram, and 25% uh, uh, of this book, or pardon me, 25 chapters of this book are going to be about Abraham and his descendants now. And so we're really where the Holy Spirit wants to go in introducing this man Abram, and we've, we've taken a lot of time to get there because we've gone slowly through the first 11 chapters, but this moment, God introduced himself to Abraham, and if you think about it, where we've gone so far is God has been very patient with a very rebellious uh, people. So far, we've seen uh, the fall in the garden, uh, right? The first man and woman, they, they blew it. Remember, we said it was a test, but it, Adam bombed. He was the first Adam bomb, right? He blew the test. 
And, and so would we have. He was our best, and he blew it. And then Cain kills Abel. That was not a good follow-up to that first story. Um, and then uh, after that, we see the wickedness of man that's growing as man's populating the earth. He's like he's just filling the world with evil until God finally has to take all of mankind out again. I mean, it was bad enough. Not only was Cain killing Abel, then you have Lamech, who's even worse, prideful. Then you have the wickedness of mankind. God wipes out the earth and starts over with a brand new family, Noah and his family, only it's right after the flood, Noah's getting drunk and naked, and it's like, oh my, well, this was our best guy, and uh-oh, we're in trouble again. And then you have um, Nimrod, who's just a Nimrod, and, and uh, his whole thing with Babel in rebellion to God, and God has to come down and destroy Babel. And it seems like it's just one thing after another. It was George Bernard Shaw who once said, if there are aliens that inhabit the other planets, or if there's aliens that inhabit other places in the universe, they probably use the, the earth as their insane asylum. <laughs> in other words, uh, things are weird here. Things are out of control here. And I mean, we, that's true now. And as you read the Bible, things are bad. And, uh, and yet God is not giving up on man, as you would think he'd get frustrated. Instead, we now find, in, starting in chapter 12, how God's plan to fulfill his promise back in Genesis 3.15 to redeem fallen man is going to start working out. He's going to start with a man. It's always where he starts, with a man. So um, put this down. We're going to see in the call of God that uh, he's calling him, and really us too, to leave it all behind. If you're going to follow the Lord, you're going to have to leave it all, put it in the word all, behind. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go forth from your country, your relatives, from your father's house to the land that I will show you. We have nothing in the Bible that suggests Abram chose God. Nothing. We only have evidence that God chose Abram. And by the way, that's always the case. Remember, that's what Jesus said to his disciples. You didn't choose me. (laughs) I chose you. And I just always remind myself that if there's anything in me or anyone else that's seeking the Lord, it's a result of God's grace in our life. We wouldn't even be seeking him. So God's not the responder. God is the initiator. The Bible says he's the author and the perfecter of faith. Put this down. Salvation involves a call to separation. Salvation always involves a call. Put in the word separation and jot down Joshua 24 and verse 2. Joshua 24, verse 2. Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, from ancient times your fathers lived beyond the river. He's talking about the Euphrates. Then he names who their fathers were. Terah, we should recognize that name, the father of Abraham and the father of the snorer, Nahor. And they, that's what his name means. And they served what? Other gods. We are told here in Joshua 24, 2, very clearly, Abram was an idolater before God introduced himself. They worshiped there in Ur of the Chaldees at that time, uh, the moon god named Nanar. And um, interesting to me that God, in his call to Abram, Abram is the father of all who believe the Bible says, so he's a picture for all of us of our own walk with the Lord, or at least he should be. Um, Remember what God told the Israelites on the night he would save them out of Egypt? We call that the Passover, right? The angel of death would pass over those homes that had taken the blood of the lamb and put it on the doorpost, the lintel of their, of their, uh, of their homes. And as uh, the angel of death would come, he'd strike death into the home of every Egyptian home or anyone that didn't have the blood on the door. But for those Israelites who believed God's promise and obeyed God's word, there was salvation. So the night of the Passover. But it wasn't just this night of God judging Egypt, it was also the night whereby he would change Pharaoh's heart. And so God told his people on the night of their salvation how they were to eat the Passover. Does anybody remember what they were to wear when they ate the Passover? What was the Passover wear? A whole line of clothing. Anybody remember? No? Yes? Yeah. Had to eat it standing up. Did you know that? You weren't supposed to sit down. Yeah, had to eat it standing up. You had to have your sandals on, and you had to have your walking stick while you ate. 
Why? Because you're leaving. <laughs> I'm saving you tonight. And by the way, when God saves, he separates. He always calls to separation. That's why when you read about don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers, which usually means don't marry a non-Christian. It's not what he says. It includes that. It's much bigger than that. There in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, don't be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership is light with darkness? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? For God himself has said, come out from their midst and be separate, saith the Lord, and I'll welcome you. You want a relationship with God? I do. He says, then you're going to have to separate yourself. And we see this right at the beginning in Abraham's life. God's calling him to leave the life that he has known before that. So you might say this. Faith always is a call to relocate spiritually, always. And it's interesting. Um, he's not just called to leave his country, but he's called to leave his friends and his family that he has been a part of. Uh, by the way, this is why some people really struggle or fail in their relationship with the Lord, right here. They're not willing to leave something God is calling them to leave. Jot down uh, Matthew 10 and verse 37. He who loves father or mother more than me, Jesus said, is not worthy of me. He who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Things and people can get in the way of our relationship and our love for the Lord. And certainly in the way of following him the way we're supposed to follow him. Remember the man who came to Jesus and said, I will follow you, but first let me... What was it? Bury my dad. Now we should go, whoa, yeah, go take care of the funeral. Jesus didn't say that. What did he say? Let the dead bury the dead. It's like, I don't even know how that would happen, but I'd like to see the video. I mean, I just, I'm not sure. We... She's talking about the spiritually dead, take care of that business, but you come follow me. His dad wasn't even dead yet. That was a phrase to use. And someday dad, my dad's going to die, and I have this allegiance to my family is what he was talking about. And Jesus is saying, you're not ready. You're not, you need to count the cost of following me. There will be a cost, and it will cost you many times relationships. Jot down Psalm 45, verses 10 and 11. I think this is a good verse that describes the bride of Christ, the call on the bride, just like in the Song of Solomon, but here in Psalm 45. Listen, O daughter, give attention and incline your ear. Forget your people and your father's house. Then the king will desire your beauty because he is your Lord bow down to him. It's the same idea. There needs to be a willingness to separate. You know, um, for some people, it's a boyfriend or it's a girlfriend or a best friend or a husband or a wife that can get in the way of your relationship with the Lord. Um, why did Adam eat <laughs> the forbidden fruit? He wasn't tricked into anything. He did it willingly. Grieve, I guess. Right? Why was it God almost killed Moses before he even got to Pharaoh, right after he gave him the commission to go and say, let my people go, and he accepted the commission? Why did God almost kill him while he was on the way? Unwilling, evidently, to circumcise his son. It didn't appear that Mrs. Mo was voting for that. You have made me a, you know... Bloody bride. Um, you're a, a, a husband of the... Yeah, she evidently opposed what God was telling him to do. And he, at least for a period of time, was willing to compromise. Oh, it's easy. We don't even see when we're doing it, when we're compromising our relationship with the Lord. Um, put this down, letter B. God promises blessings beyond belief. And uh, here in our text, we're going to find out that there are actually seven in this original calling of Abraham. Seven promises. Number one, God promises to lead a believer somewhere new. Somewhere new. Um, in our text, he tells them very specifically uh, that he will take them to a, a, another land that they had not seen. So we know Abram is going to go from his country to a land he said that he would show them. In other words, I'm going to take you someplace you've never been when you become a Christian, you're, you're in the same way the Lord's saying, I'm going to take you somewhere you've never been. I don't care if you've grown up in church. I don't care how many Sunday school classes you attended. This is not about knowledge. This is about 
an adventure that I'm taking you on, a personal one. And, um, you know, uh, someone said it this way, we aren't saved by making promises to God, we're saved by believing God's promises to us. I like that. That's exactly right. Faith is, is believing the promises that God has made to us. And salvation, while it includes moving away from sin, and if need be sinners, the separation, it's more than just moving away from sin. It's actually moving in obedience to what God has promised and what he's, what he's commanded, like someone said earlier. I, I, I see in Jesus' ministry kind of two words he used commonly for his altar call. Do you remember what they were? Two words. Follow me. Follow me. That was his invitation. Follow me. Follow me. And I, I see that same thing here with the Lord, but Jesus used follow me. Jot down Matthew 4 and verse 19. He said, follow me. That's the invitation. But here's the promise. I'll make you fishers of men. I'll make you something that you're not. And we're told when he said that to Peter, James, and John, they immediately abandoned their boats. They were fishermen. They left their nets and their father. <laughs> left it all behind and they... They followed Jesus. You know, um, police work um, is not, for most police departments, like it is when you watch it on TV. By the way, neither is working in an ER in a hospital. We know that, right? I mean, if, if it was exactly the way real life was, the ratings wouldn't be quite as good as they can be when it's nonstop action. But uh, growing up watching police work and cop shows on TV, I thought it was, <laughs> till I went on ride-alongs and said, where's all the robberies and the gangs with the chains and knives and you know, all the action that I saw? Like, well, we were rolling code three everywhere. And, um, and I'll never forget, one of my training officers said to me, he said, you know, he said, police work for the most part is kind of routine. You, you do the same things over and over. You drive the same streets. You take reports after the fact. You know, somebody broke into some business or some car got broken into or car got stolen or, you know, somebody hit somebody. It's all after the fact, and you're just recording it in case they can prosecute it. Your job's not usually to investigate it. He said, so for a lot of the time, for most cops, it's about 95% routine. He said, it's maybe about 3% excitement, and it's about 2% sheer terror. <laughs> and I think that's a pretty good description of a lot of the police work that I did. A lot of routine, just kind of ordinary, kind of going you know, through the same things over and over again. And, and it's funny, when I left law enforcement to become a pastor, I had a lot of people say, don't you miss it? Like, you're a pastor now, and you used to be a cop. <laughs> You know, it's like, oh, no, no. I, 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 I Believe me, that was way more boring than my job is now. Way, this is way more exciting. Listen, can I tell you something? If you think the Christian life is boring, it's pretty obvious to me you're not following Jesus. Let me say that again. If you are of the opinion the Christian life is boring, would you please go back and read about following Jesus in the Gospels and the kind of things that happened when people follow Jesus, or, or for that matter, just think of the children of Israel in the wilderness. How did God lead the children of Israel through the wilderness? Do you remember what it was? It was a pillar of cloud by day, pillar of fire, so they could see, right, <laughs> at night. And here's what it says. Uh, they just had to go where the pillar went. And so if the pillar stopped, it would be like, okay, hey, wait, hold on. We're We're stopping. How long? I don't know. It's right now. Okay, it's, well, we might as well, it's, the sun's going down, we might as well, can't, put the tents out. <laughs> yep, still there. Sometimes one day. Sometimes a year, it says. You just never knew. You didn't know if, we're moving, quick, let's go. Break camp, what? He's moving. Every day was like that for the children of Israel. You never knew. You had to be ready to go, kind of like with the staff and 
Yeah, kind of that's the whole idea, is walking by faith means you do not know how your day is going to end. Not just because you live on planet Earth, but because you're following the creator of the Earth and your Lord. It's a different kind of a thing altogether. And so Jesus says, follow me. You know, no one says follow me to you unless they're going somewhere you can't get to unless you follow them. Why follow them? Just while they meet me down at, you know, Kino's. Well, I know how to get there. I don't have to follow you. <laughs> but if you tell me, meet me at Slobovia's and I've never been there, I'm going to have to follow you there. Or you, know, you have to give me the address or something. Put this down. God promises to grow the believer by faith. He says, go forth from your country, your relatives, your father's house to the land. I'll show you. I will make you a great nation. Put in the word grow. I will make you a great nation. And you think about it. Could there have been anything farther from reality at the time that God said it? I mean, how many people are in Abraham's family right now? Well, I guess it'd just be the two of them. Just the two of us, like the song says, right? Great nation? I don't think so. He is 75 years old. He did not have any children and didn't look like was good prospects for that. His wife is 65. Haven't had any kids. They wanted kids, but they're barren. He's not a great nation. He's a great nothing, probably. Now, you know, I mean... It's, it's not like it's going it, to... Here, here's the thing. God says, I'm going to make you a great nation, and yet there's no evidence, A, that that's true now or ever going to be that way. That's what it means to walk by faith, is you take the promises of God. They don't make sense to you, but you say, hey, if God said it, I believe it, and I'm going to operate on the basis of that. Faith makes people say what maybe, I don't know, Maybe the Dodgers are saying, the Dodger fans are saying right this moment, what Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. <laughs> I don't know how the world series is going to end. But Abram is being told, I'm, by God, he doesn't say, I'm going I'm to give you a few kids. I'm going to give you one kid. I'm going to make you a great nation. Now, that's very interesting to me. The Bible says in Romans, in hope against hope, he believed God's word. Jot down Isaiah 51 and verse 2. God says there, Look to Abraham, your father, and to Sarah, who gave you birth to you in pain. When he was but one, I called him. That doesn't mean God called him when he was one year old. It means he called him when he was just one man. <laughs> then I blessed him, and I multiplied him. What does that mean for you and me? If you and I are to walk like Abraham walked in faith, it means that you accept that your story is not over yet. Even if you feel like, well, it doesn't look like God will ever use me in any great way or way to honor him, or well, I, I just think it looks like my life's going to turn out this way. Don't say that. It ain't over till it's over. What if, like Abraham, for you, your story is just beginning right now? He's 75. Some of you feel like, I'm getting old and on in life, and God's never... He just, he is just starting. Who knows what God might still want to do with your life. Now, number three is missing from your outline. And I'm to blame. So I'll give it to you. You'll have to actually write all these words in. God promises to bless us personally. It doesn't matter what the fill-in is because they're all being filled in. God promises to bless us personally. He says... There, I, this is at the end of verse 2, I will bless you. Now, let me ask, what does it mean when God says, I will bless you? If you're blessed by God, what is that? We use that word all the time. I'm so blessed. May God bless you. You know, what does it mean? Yes. God honors you. Okay. What does it mean to be blessed of God? Yes. To show favor. Oh, I like that. Anybody else? Yeah. He has you covered. Okay. Anything else? Blessed. More than you ask or think. Ooh, I'm liking this. Keep, let's keep going there. Anybody else? What does it mean? Are you blessed? And you go, I, I don't know. I don't know what the definition is. I, I hope so. 
Yeah. Okay, receiving something you don't deserve. Well, let's take, yes. It means happy. It, it absolutely does. Now, in the Old Testament, the term in Hebrew is barak. <laughs> take that up with the Lord. I didn't create the Hebrew language. Um, and it means to bow down. Um, it's about a, an inferior bowing before a superior. But in the New Testament, there in Matthew 5, we have what we call the Beatitudes, where we have uh, nine different times Jesus shares who is blessed. And that word makarios er, in, uh, in Greek means to be happy. Happy are the poor in spirit, uh, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Or happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But it's, it's the word blessed. And I think that's very interesting. Now, now, I know there's a lot of times, especially us preachers, talk about you know happiness versus joy. And I think there's even sometimes some attitudes that I'm not sure are very biblical uh, among some Christians. Like, well, I don't want to be happy. I just want joy. Yeah. Need that happiness stuff. Uh, I, I don't know. The Bible says happy are the people whose God is the Lord. So I'll take both if they're available. Um, you, know, you think about the Declaration of Independence guarantees you the right as an American. Well, really, it says God gives it to you. In inalienable rights to life, liberty on the... Yeah, as an American, you have the right to pursue happiness. <laughs> but absolutely no guarantee you're ever going to get it <laughs> at all. Just you go pursue it, baby. <laughs> but here... Abraham, in the blessing of God, is, is promised uh, that he would be blessed. And in our walk with the Lord, we have this confidence. Lord, I don't know what's going to happen. See, here says the person who's walking by faith promises them stressing, <laughs> right? In the world, you will have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. And... I'm using that trial. I'm using that. I'm not saying you won't have any trials. Don't think, oh, it's just going to be this obviously easy life. But you have the confidence of saying, I have the blessing of God on my life no matter what happens. Whether it's things I wanted, it's better than I asked for, it's completely different, not at all what I wanted, but I'm trusting God. I mean, think about Mary and Joseph. All they wanted to do was get married. What's wrong with getting married? That's what they wanted. Just a normal Jewish wedding, happy to be together, honeymoon. Yeah, that's not going to quite work out that way. And sometimes God has to destroy your dream <laughs> to bring you something far better than you would ever have asked for, to use you in a way that you would not even know how to ask. And so when things aren't going well in our lives, we say, but I'm walking by faith, and so I know God is in charge, he's good, he's governing, and he's going to work things together for what he, to bless me and to bring him glory. So I have the blessing of God on my life, even though I don't always see it until it's in the rearview mirror, and even sometimes then. Put this down, number four, God promises you a great name, a great name. Now maybe you already like yours, I don't know. But look at what he says there. He says, I will make your name great. Okay, Abraham. Now listen, Abraham, um, we, can, we can gather some things about Abraham. We don't know these for sure. But we do know that he came from Ur of the Chaldees. He evidently, uh, though he doesn't have children, which was not a plus, um, he was wealthy. We, we can tell that. He, he evidently had some uh, either money that he inherited or money that he invested and was doing fine with flocks and herds and even as he's traveling. Um, and he has some political clout as a result of that. We also know that while he doesn't have children, he clearly married a very attractive woman. How can we figure that out? I call Sarah Miss Mesopotamia. Um, because at 65, the king of the world thinks that she's a knockout and wants to take her, does take her into his, into his harem. 65. 
I don't know what beauty cream she was using, but it worked. Uh, so he, he's married to an attractive woman, and uh, he's, he's evidently got wealth. By the way, Ur of the Chaldees was not primitive. Um, it is, it is uh, from the archaeology that's been done, very, very sophisticated, wealthy people, um, large homes, 20 to 30 rooms or, or rooms of, of, in their home, huge. It's where the bathtub was invented, by the way. So they had hot tubs and uh, way, way back when. So here's a guy who has kind of a lot going for him in, in, in terms of culture, but he, he lacks the thing that matters the most. He, he, he doesn't have any legacy, and that mattered so much. What, what, am, what does my life count beyond my life? If you don't have children, you see, the feeling was, it doesn't. I, some of you remember, I've talked about this, that the most important, uh, famous unbeliever who affects society, there are big names that we study in history, you know, of people who didn't know the Lord. Uh, maybe Napoleon or Genghis Khan or some of these you know, world rulers, and, and we, we know of them. We, we can read and read and read about things they accomplished. But from God's standpoint, it's very different. By the way, that's why you don't read about everything that happens in history in the Bible. It doesn't matter. It doesn't even rate to be in God's history book. It's not, it's not important on the, in the scheme of things. Very interesting. Uh, and I like that illustration that it's kind of like the most significant non-Christian who did the most that we've all studied in history is kind of like in terms of eternity, like that big aircraft carrier or cruise ship that goes through the harbor, and you look at the wake of the ship, and it's this huge wake. Might go out for a mile, but compared to the ocean, in an hour or two, it's gone forever. And in terms of eternity, the unbeliever makes no impact for the glory of God ever. God's looking at things completely different. So God's taking this man who has no legacy, no impact on even time, much less eternity, and he is going to give him, make him, even though he's already 75 and he's not famous yet, God says, I'm going to give you a great name. Now, interesting. They tell us, and I don't know how they figured this out, about 107 billion people have lived and died on planet Earth. But God says to Abraham, I'm going to put my spotlight on you. And he did, if you think about it. Right now, about four of the seven billion people on the planet revere the name Abraham. About 2.2 billion Christians. About 1.6 billion Muslims and numerous million Jews all revere the name Abraham. Over half the world's population today, all these years later, still know his name, still respect him. Very interesting. God fulfilled this. God nailed it. He did it. He's given him a great name. I mean, it's just, it, he's done that. Um, can I tell you something? Within your soul and my soul, there is a desire for glory. Okay. Now, we tend to think that's all wrong. You know, the kid who gets the basketball, who never passes, right? We all have a name for that. He always shoots, misses, when he could have given it to me and I could have missed. We call that being a glory hog, right? And we, we, we talk about pride, and it's true. You know, is this not Babylon the Great that I myself have been? Yes, it's the initial sin. But the desire for glory is not in and of itself sin. In fact, God has made you, read Romans, in a righteous way, to want glory. It's about who's giving it to you and who it's ultimately for that matters. But God says, Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. And it was a good thing. It wasn't like, oh, God, you shouldn't do that. Some of you may have heard me. I don't know what your earliest memory is. You know, our earliest memories are kind of weird because they kind of little, little things that happened to us when we were little kids maybe. I was probably three, maybe two. I don't know. But I distinctly remember, I'm the youngest of five, my mom and my older, I think my brother, it might have been my sister, I don't know, were in the other room. And they had, uh, my mom had put, told me to go to my bedroom. And I remember, I don't know if she wanted me to pick up my toys or go to take a nap, but I was in there. And I didn't really want to be in there, but I heard them talking. 
I couldn't understand what they were saying, but I remember this thought. What if I'm really the king of the world? And they're pretending that I'm not. And they want to keep it a secret. Because if I knew the truth, I'd be telling them what to do. This is two or three years old. These thoughts are running through my mind. I still wonder from time. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> my middle son, Valor. Um, very interesting that we named him Valor, not knowing uh, that he was going to be very timid when he would be growing up. When he was younger, he was very timid. He once was frightened at a cat that was asleep on my neighbor's lawn. He came back very afraid of the cat that was there, like it was a monster. And so he'd have to grow into that name, Valor. But he was um, rather shy, but a sweet-spirited young man, and I'll, I'll never, very generous. Um, I remember once we, he came home, we came home, uh, Becky and him had gone through McDonald's or had some fast food I hadn't eaten, and he was sitting there eating hot McDonald's fries on the table in front of me, which I think is not very nice anyway, but any because I was really hungry. And, and so he could tell I wanted one. So I, he said, Dad, you want one? And I said, oh, OK. And so he gave me a fry. And he enjoyed watching me like it. So he started feeding me the fries. And I was so impressed that he was, because I'm thinking, I probably wouldn't do that. I mean, he's, he's giving me these French fries of his while he's still hungry. And I turned to him, and I said, Valor, I said, that's amazing. I said, you're so generous. I said, I said you're my hero. He goes, no, I'm not. I go, yeah, you're my hero. He goes, I'm not. I go, Valerie, you're my hero. He goes, I'm a king. <laughs> hey. <laughs> so I read about God saying, I'm going to make your name great. And I think to myself, well, this is not a promise that someday I'll be famous in myself. Here's the idea. You and me, we're in Christ now. And one day, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. This is already true. We are in him, the one who is the most famous. We have a great name already. Amen? Hey, put this down. Uh, you are blessed to become a blessing. We all want to be blessed, but please notice why. He said there in verse 2, he says, I'll make your name great, so you shall be. You know, there are today in our day and age, and for the last, I'd say, 20 years uh, pronounced in the United States that I've seen, maybe longer, a, a fair number of Christians and some of the largest churches in America where the theology is about, it's all about you. The Bible is the ultimate self-help book. If you want to know how to run a business, here it is. If you want to have good relationships, here it is. You want to meet the guy, meet the girl, and get them to love you, here. In other words, it's all about technique, and this book is, is your book of how to get to where uh, you want to be. And so we, we read, oh, God, I want, God's going to bless me. But here's the reality. If you read this blessing that God is putting on Abraham's life, God isn't blessing him to be a container of blessing. He's blessing him to become a channel of blessing. In other words, I'll bless you, but I'm blessing you so that other people can be blessed. I think we miss this often. It's just because we're, I'm, look, I'm the same way. You know, our three best friends humanly are me, myself, and I. You know, our favorite song is me, 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 me. We, I don't have to work. Nobody has to say, Bob, take care of yourself. Oh, I wasn't going to do that. <laughs> I'm big on that. I wake up thinking about me and my comfort. And, you know, I mean, if I'm, if I'm in pain, I, I baby myself, you know. Um, I try to think when my wife's turning, what would I do? I would care. I, would, I need this. I have to. I love her. But I literally, that doesn't come as natural to me. Um, Last night in the dunk tank, I was dunked three times. And I do not know what's in that tank. Because there's not supposed to be anything in there. But whatever it is, I hit it three times. My elbow hit it three times. At the time, it didn't bother me too much. Middle of the night, it bothered me a whole lot. I woke up in this terrible pain because of my elbow. No, I'm not going to sue the church. <laughs> But 
I care about me. I take care of me. I look out for me. So I don't want to look at Scripture that it's only about me or primarily about me, but it's my nature to do it. Jot down John 7, 37. This is a verse I think we do it with all the, we do it a lot more than we know. Here's the promise. On the last day of the great day of the feast, Jesus stood up and he cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Now, he's saying if you're thirsty, it's personal. Spiritually, you're dry. Come to Jesus and drink. But we don't have the next verse, do we? That's just it. Let him come to me and drink. And you know the promise. And out of his innermost being shall flow rivers, or some translations say torrents, of living water. With this he spoke of the Spirit. Now, here's the thing. We think of that and go, yeah, that's right. If you'll come to Jesus, he will, he'll, he'll satisfy your thirst. That's true. But that's not all that verse says. If he's going to make you a torrent or a, 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 a fountain of living waters, what does that tell you? How much water does a fountain, how thirsty is a fountain? Not at all. A fountain becomes a source for thirsty people. What did David say? You know, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, besides which my cup is filled to the rim with him. No. My cup what? It's overflowing. Do, do you see the difference? God is saying, I want you to be so blessed that you become a source of blessing for other people. It's my intention. The reason I'm blessing you, it is to fulfill your needs, but it's much more than that. It's to satisfy the needs of people around you because I want to use you as a vehicle whereby I'll bless other people. Well, put this down to number six. God ties his blessing to how people treat his own. Uh, there is a very important, you've heard this perhaps, and I think it's fascinating historically. He said, I'll bless those who bless you, and the, ones who curses, the one who curses you, I will curse. Um, it seems, if you look at history, virtually every nation that has persecuted the Jewish people has gone into a decline. Think, think of Egypt. Egypt was a world empire in the ancient world during the time of Abram. There's going to be a famine in a few verses. He's going down to, <laughs> he's going down to Egypt. Always going down. People, by the way, you always go down to Egypt. You go up to Jerusalem. You go down to Egypt. And it's, it's almost always an expression of unbelief unless God's ordering you there. And those are the rare exceptions. But... Egypt, world empire, but where is it today? <laughs> Not a world empire. Some would call it a third world country. Babylon attacked Israel. The Babylonians are gone. Look at Iraq. Talk about a place that is messed up. Those are the descendants. That's the geography of Babylon. Israel remains. Israel is a strong nation. Um, Rome tried to destroy Israel, Jerusalem, but the Roman Empire is no more after their persecution of the Jews. The Greeks um, absolutely have fallen apart their empire after defaming the temple. Spain, after the Inquisition, was reduced to a fifth-rate nation. Germany, in more recent history, I mean, Germany in the 20th century was becoming a world empire, intended to take over the world. Incredible power. Almost did it. Persecuted the Jews. Look at it today compared to where it was just 60 or 70 years ago. I do believe, in part, the reason God has blessed prospered, and even protected and preserved this nation is because we have been a nation that has been a refuge historically for the Jewish people, for the persecuted Jews. And if that changes, I believe God's protection and blessing on this nation isn't just because of our forefathers. I believe it has in part to do with this commitment of God. Those who bless you, I will bless. Those who curse you, 
I will curse. Very, very interesting uh, to me. And then number seven, God promises to deliver a universal source of blessing. In the final uh, promise here, he says, I will, um, or pardon me, in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. And that's pretty radical. Not only am I going to make you a great nation, you're going to be famous, but beyond that, in you, every family in the entire world will be able to be blessed. Now, that's pretty cool. Let me ask you, what was that blessing that God was promising in that verse? Raise your hand. I heard somebody say something. Yes. How so? Yes, you can. I believe in you. Walk by faith, not by Bob. Jesus is the descendant of Abraham. Jesus is the Messiah. God's redeeming mankind, and he's starting with a man. He's going to create a nation, and it's, it, it is the Messiah. And how, by the way, how do we know that it's the Messiah? How, how, do we, how can we verify that? Besides just, I think it is. Anybody? Give me a Bible answer on that. Yeah, over here. Okay, signs and wonders that he did. Anybody else? Yes. Matthew 1. So showing that he's a descendant from Abraham. Okay. Yeah. Say again. Christ is the only one that rose from the dead. Jesus did. Okay. So in chapter 22, this promise gets a little bit more particular. We won't turn there, but... Here it says, in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Later, God will refine it and say, in your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Who is the seed of Abraham? David? Jesus is the seed of Abraham? Okay. So in the New Testament, we are told that God didn't say, though he could have, the seeds of Abraham, plural, referring to the Jewish people. Some people say, well, this was a promise that the Jewish people would be a blessing. And certainly God has used the Jewish people. Look, God made the, his people, the chosen people, the nation of Israel, and from them we received the law of God, the, the revelation of God. We have the Bible because of Abraham and his descendants. But specifically, Paul tells us that the promise in your seed, singular, he was referring to the Messiah. And so here we have this promise. I'm going to bless you, and you're going to be, you're ultimately you and your descendants, and one particular person that I have in mind <laughs> is going to come from you, and guess what? He will become a blessing to the whole world. Why is Jesus a blessing to the whole world? Let me ask it like that. In what way is Jesus a blessing to the whole world? Because he died for the whole world. The people who have never heard of him. He died for every single human being on this planet. And it's in Jesus Christ that the promises of God are fulfilled. I don't care who you're talking to. I don't care what language they speak. I don't care what country you're in. Jesus Christ is the blessing that God has for them, you see. In you... All the families of the earth, everybody who lives on this planet, there's a blessing. It is their Messiah, too. It is their Savior who's going to come from, in this case, your loins, Abraham. And so that's what he's teaching Abraham, but he's also teaching it to us. We, the blessing of God on our life is to become a vehicle of blessing, not just, I love you, God bless you, can I help you? But I want you to meet my Savior. I want you to meet the one who saved me. I now have the privilege. You have the privilege of being a source of blessing, ultimate blessing to anyone who ever lives on this planet. That's the idea. Finally, let's put this down. God is calling you to live life as a faith road trip. We're called to walk by faith, not by sight. Peter Marshall, I don't know how many of you, some of you know his name. Um, he was a, a chaplain in, in uh, the Senate. Immigrated to the United States 
arriving at Ellis Island in 1927, only 19 years before being named Senate chaplain. He pastored in Georgia and then at Washington's New York Avenue Presbyterian Church. And on January 5th, 1947, he was named Senate chaplain. And his prayers immediately touched the nation. This was a prayer offered before the United States Senate on November 24th, 1947. Here's what he said. God of our fathers and our God, give us the faith to believe in the ultimate triumph of righteousness, no matter how dark and uncertain are the skies of today. We pray for the bifocals of faith that see the despair and the need of the hour, but also see further on the patience of our God working out his plan in the world he has made. So help thy servants to interpret for our time the meaning of the motto inscribed on our coins. Make our faith honest by helping us this day to do one thing because thou hast said do it, or to abstain because thou hast said thou shalt not. How can we say we believe in thee or even want to believe in thee when we do not anything that thou dost tell us? May our faith be seen in our works through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. He says, Lord, give us bifocals. <laughs> help us to see what's going on, but also help us to focus on your plans, your promises in the word of God. To walk by faith, we need both. We need to say, Lord, I, I want to be not walking simply by sight. We're not going to be blind to the things on this earth by any means. Walking by faith doesn't mean we ignore the things that are. We're not to lean on our understanding, but we are to be men and women who understand the times we live in. But we don't make our judgments based on that. You see, we see beyond them. That's why I like this prayer. Bifocals of faith. Yeah, God, that's what I want. I want to remember the promise, seven promises that he's made to Abraham that I think in very much a real sense, there's application for me and you. Lord, make me a man of faith. Make me a woman of faith. And let me be willing to leave anybody and anything. What does the old song say? The cross before me, the world behind me, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back. Is there somebody that's holding you back? Somebody that you're compromising for? God's calling you to leave anything that would call you back. Sometimes it's stuff. Sometimes it's not people, it's stuff. As Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. <laughs> What's keeping you back? Let's pray.